Hey everybody, it's Matt Finch, and we are working on uh, probably the first episode of a new playlist called Making D&D Stuff. Um, and so my, uh, my guests here tonight are Bill and Charlie Rayor. Say hello to everybody. Hi. Uh, hey there. Uh, now, these two guys are um, about half, I guess, of the uh, component of Beetle and Grimm's. And for those who aren't familiar with Beetle and Grimm's, uh, it, it's the very, very high-end manufactured props for playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And so we're sort of starting way up at the top of the pyramid and want to talk a little bit about manufacturing and so on and so forth. And then we're going to work our way down. We're going to talk about 3D printing and things in, in later episodes. But I've got these guys on the show um, sort of for a, a good starter. And Beetle and Grimm's really produces um, the very high-end sort of stuff, um, which you guys sell – um, is it all in platinum boxes or do you do lesser boxes like gold boxes and wood boxes and things like that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, you know, last year we, we, we we're almost exactly a year old. Um, so we launched in, uh, April of 2018 and our first product was a platinum box for Waterdeep Dragon Heist, which was the, uh, official D and D release that year. Um, we uh, uh, we sold out of that, and um, a, a lot of people asked us about doing a silver edition or a gold edition of something, and that's always been part of the plan. Um, but as a young company with uh, you know trying to figure out all of these different things about um, the product lines and capital and flow and all of these things. We decided to keep it really simple in the first year and just do a platinum edition. Um, but we're a couple of weeks away from uh, shipping our first ever silver edition, which will be for Ghosts of Saltmarsh. So we're trying a, a slightly different price point for that and um, trying to figure out you know, how to offer the same levels of quality um, but just a, a smaller amount to have a smaller price point that'll still be um, exciting for people. What are the different price points that you guys have used for the platinum box, for the silver box, and so on? Right. Uh, well, the, the platinum edition is is four ninety nine, and the silver edition is one seventy five. And um, we're talking we're, we're talking in hundreds of dollars here, <laughs> not not four ninety nine and, and one seventy nine. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Yes. Four hundred and ninety nine dollars. Yeah. So so I'm I'm gonna reach off screen here because you know when we say four hundred and ninety nine dollars, it, it sounds um shocking, but I wanted you to see how big this four hundred and ninety nine dollar box is. So this is the box of Waterdeep Dragonized. Um so when, when we do a $500 box, we, we are uh, giving you an awful lot of stuff for that $500. Absolutely. And plus, you know, I, I think, and I think everyone knows that making stuff is expensive. Um, do you, it, it's, I'm assuming that it's put together in China and that the, they ship, they put the box together and all of that, or is it done in the U.S.? Or where do you do it? Well, <laughs> the answer is yes, yes. To all those things. <laughs> all of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we we um, we had some things manufactured in China. We had things uh, for the this last for Waterdeep. We had it manufactured in Detroit as well. Most of the printing was done there. Um, and you know we're continuing to refine that. I think one of the biggest one of the biggest tricks really is to you know, find good partners. And that's, that's you know, we've, we had good partners for Waterdeep and we're continuing to uh, reach out and find our partners for the Salt Marsh one or in Canada. And so most of the work was done up there. Um, and, you know, we'll just continue that as we go for the next platinum edition as well. You know, one of the, um, one of the, the challenges that we have, um, and it's, it's a nice problem to have, but uh, as a licensee of Wishes of the Coast, that means we're also a licensee of Hasbro. Um, and that creates a lot of extra layers of scrutiny when we are uh, using a, you know, manufacturing in China or warehouse that's outside of the United States. Anything that we do outside of the United States, we have to go through a lot of vetting uh, and inspections to get it approved so that it, it meets Hasbro standards. 
which I imagine is a two-edged sword, because while that could be a pain in the ass, it also means that you are getting their expertise at troubleshooting. Yeah, yeah. yes, to a certain degree. Um, it, it also, or, or it's you know, just I a mean, pain in the ass. I mean, you can say it's just a pain it's, in the ass. Well, it's, it's, it, it, it is challenging, for sure. Pain in the um, ass. I mean, as, as ethical people, I like to say we are ethical people. You know, we, we don't want to be in a situation where we're using a, a, a substandard facility anyway. Um, but um, the, the, it definitely is, uh, you know, for for five guys who have just started a business and have never run a, this kind of business, um, that kind of bureaucracy is challenging for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask a question about that because, you know, five guys starting business you started a year ago. But your very first product was as a licensee for Wizards of the Coast on a, you know, half a million dollar sized project. How'd you get that? So, um, so a, a year before, in in 2017, um, one of our partners, the actor uh, Matt Lillard, um, was invited to go participate in the streaming D and D event. Uh, it was in Seattle that year. Now it's in Los Angeles, but in 2017 it was held in Seattle. And he brought us all along so that we could play because you know we've been gaming together for 20 some odd years this group of guys um and while we were there um we just kind of came up with this idea through discussions amongst ourselves of you know what what we would like to do we saw all these other licensees who were at the streaming event and they were all showing their products and talking about these cool things that they were doing with D&D and and being part of this licensee community and we just started talking about, you know, what would we like to see if we were gamers? What's the thing that that we feel like uh, has been missing? And the the sort of concept we came up with was, um, so I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan. And we were thinking about it that, you know, Pearl Jam will sell albums in a store for $15.99 for people who want a Pearl Jam album. But then they'll also sell like a big expensive box set for people like me who really want a, a, a more extensive, elaborate, uh, in-depth experience, you know, that has books and different versions of different songs and, you know, a history. Sure, yeah, I'm, a Dave, I'm a Dave Matthews fan, so I know okay. exactly what you're talking about. You've got all the stuff that you can yeah. get. Yeah, exactly. So, so that was what we started thinking about is, you know, for people – you know, there's a generation of people like us who were playing D and D back in the '70s and '80s, and you know, when we started out, we had more time than we had money, and now that we're of a slightly more advanced age, a lot of us have more money than time, and so the idea of a really um, uh, ex extended, immersive box where a lot of cool stuff is being done for you um, sounded really appealing. So. Matt sort of <laughs> sidewalk pitched this thing. Yeah, we were, so I mean, we're all, uh, what's the right word? We're all a little introverted and we're all talking about how we could go about this and you know, how we could pitch it. And Matt's like, Nathan is right there. I'm gonna go talk to him. And we're, I'm like, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn it. And, <laughs> but but thank God he did because yeah. uh, they responded to it instantly. They were really excited about the concept, and you know we knew that coming out of the gate, it was we were going to do this as a licensee or we weren't going to do it at all. Right. Um, because as as five guys with a company that nobody's ever heard of trying to get people to buy something that's five hundred dollars, we felt like. Um, to start with, we really needed to be doing D and D products as a licensee because that was going to give us some credibility with people where they would be willing to take a chance on us. Now, people, you guys, you guys are yourselves a D and D group. So, here's the thing: like, for example, um, I'm a publisher and a writer of D and D stuff, and one of the things that I used to do was back in the '80s, I would try and make stuff look exactly like. Um, the, uh, the TSR stuff. And this movement that I just did with my pen is that little uh, yellow banner that's on the side of things. 
so I, I've got this vision, which might or might not be, you know, correct of, of you know, did when back in the day in, in the eighties, okay, you guys are stuff people. Were you making props and things like that for the, for the group? It's sort of pre presaging what you were going to be doing now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. um, you know, Charlie is my older brother. And uh, when I started playing, he was my DM. That's how I learned to play. Um, and after he killed off three or four of my parties, I as one on. does. That's just yeah, one. It yeah, was sorry, yeah. shocking, right? <laughs> so then I moved on to DMing my friends and killing them off on a regular basis. And yeah, absolutely, we were the guys who would, you know, if a player found a note, you would, you know, you would hand write it out and you'd put it in the oven and get it all crinkly and you know all that kind of stuff. But now. You know, now we get to make stuff like this that looks really in world, um, but it's it's being done by professionals. Now let's are, let's let's hold on to that thing for a second because sure. the the code of laws. What t give me an idea of what's in um, what's actually inside the boxes? You showed me the size of the box. Now, what kind of stuff is in there? Okay, so. Um, so the first thing we do is we we break up the we, it includes the actual adventure the published adventure okay um, but we we break it up into multiple books um, one of the things as a DM especially for these really complicated uh, adventures that that Wizards puts out now they're you know they're not easy to run um, some of them are pretty challenging they're very um, sandboxy so players can kind of go where they want to go it isn't that you know that old uh, the old Gary Gygax ones where you basically have hallway room, hallway room, and you, you know, you kind of, right. everybody's kind of on a track. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we break the, the module down into smaller books. So it's a little easier for the DM to manage. That is a really brilliant idea because, um, you know, Frog God Games used to publish these books that were this thick, you know, they were 500 page <laughs> books and um, they were, it's not, you know, people like having, a great big book, same way that they like getting a great big box. But, um, you know, that was one of my objections to those. And in fact, our next, uh, the project that I'm working on is, it splits out um, stats from the rest of the book. It's a, it's a really good idea, I think, to for playability. And it's nice to hear um, when whenever people are really focused on usability, that, that is such a crucial portion. And I think that a lot of people go for splash and appearance over usability so I'm, I'm it's awesome that that you guys do that I, i'm off track but, so let's get back to what's in the box <laughs> that's cool so so and the other part of that i don't know if we have an example here but the other part of that is that we pull out all of the major art from the book because you know as a dm you know how it is when you have the book and you want to show this really great piece of art but if it's in the book, you have to hold up the book and you're covering up the text and they can only see it for a second because you need the book. So we pull out these great pieces of art from the book and give it to you on something that you can just hang on your DM screen. So the players can see it, they can see it for as long as they want and right. you've still got the book in front of you. Um, we I, also, I, should, I should interject here also since I forgot to do it at the beginning because I'm not so set on my intro. Um, but I, these guys did not pay me to be on the show. Nobody pays me to be on the show. I pick out people, um, just from the community at large. These aren't commercial. So I just wanted to let everybody know that let's go. And so again, I'm off topic. Let's go back to the stuff in the box, more stuff. Okay, cool. Um, and so we also, um, commissioned some, uh, bonus art where we see opportunities of, uh, you know, something that we think they they weren't able to include in the book where we said, boy, that would be a great piece to include. So we have the ability to go out and commission extra art pieces and, and create things that, that are exclusive to our box. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, we write a series of bonus encounters that can be, you know, they're just little self-contained little encounters but in, a, in that kind of sandboxy environment that something like Waterdeep is, or um, there's a lot of that too with their new adventure, a Descent into Avernus that they just announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, 
where as a DM, it's really helpful when the players get stuck or they've gone a long time without combat and you can tell that they're just itching to have something that they can take down. So we include these little bonus encounters that you can literally just sort of throw in anytime you want. Um, it, it's just a tool for the DMs to keep things moving, keep things fresh and, and throw in a, a little original something every now and then whenever you want to. Um, okay. We include a set of these encounter cards. Um, there's 40 of these in the Platinum Edition. And what these are are the major encounters that you're going to have in the adventure. It has the art on one side, and it has all the DM's info on the other. And again, this is something that's designed to hang on your DM screen. So you've got a heads up of the monster manual stats for the beholder on one side when if they're fighting a beholder. And then on the other side, you've got the art for the players to see as they're fighting it. Very cool. Um, you want to go through handouts? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we have, um, okay, you know, it's, it's just pulling, it's, it's just creating sort of a more immersive experience so that, you know, when they get, when they get something in the book, instead of describing it to them, you can just hand it to them. Which is um, always, I, I mean, you can't, you can't get more fun than that. I, I just saw a, um, that was a war game where the, the guy who was doing the war game um, had, had uh, this is at, at Enfilad, um, and he had the orders for the different troops, and there was like a little map, and they put it in the oven, you know, with the with the coffee and uh, and all of that. So yeah, I mean, handouts are 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 really um, that everybody loves those. Yeah, it yeah. just it just makes you feel like you're part of the world, you know. We got to make some really big fun ones too. I don't know how well you can see this, but it's, uh, the water deep wazoo. It's a, so it's a newspaper? The town newspaper, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, so there are a bunch of those. Um, we did a bunch of battle maps. Uh, this is one piece here. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have, you know, for years we play with minis. Not everybody does, but we do, and we really enjoy them. And, you know, we have a dry erase mat on the table, uh, and John, our, our DM, comes through with his little – dry erase marker and you know makes little chicken scratches on the, the the mat to let us know where the walls are and it's it's fine but it's really fun when you can lay out the room and really see it in front of you and know exactly where you can go and can't go and where that five foot step is and all that um so we we that's it after Waterdeep the 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 main piece of feedback that we got on the water deep one was more battle maps we want more battle maps yeah so that's, that's definitely be... a, the fifth edition players are um fairly conditioned to play with minis although that really happened about third edition where you couldn't play it without them yeah uh, which now which edition is it that you guys play I tell you, is it fifth or is it an earlier edition no we're we're 5e for sure yeah. Yeah, we, we basically went straight from 3.5 to 5 without without hitting four much that was good yeah right. good, good call <laughs> no comments on four. <laughs> I can't say anything i actually don't think that wizards uh thinks there was a fourth edition i think they've collectively forgotten about it I, so has everyone else except for about you know there's 20 or 30 people who still you know who really found their game with that but i don't think it was very many people yeah F fifth is so good it's it's such a great system yeah, I, I play um, uh, the original edition, this, probably right right before it goes into advanced D and D. So it doesn't even have a number. But um, the uh, the what fifth edition did was it backed up much closer to the way that things were played very early in the game, and they right. certainly didn't get all the way back there. But I th I thought it was a good smart retreat from the complexity of the rules that would make you have to have miniatures for one thing you know speaking of the you know just of the props you know that like even the newspaper type thing in third edition that would almost distract from the game because the entire game was very focused on the minis and so fifth edition you know and the earlier editions there was much more variety that you could use in terms of just you know general stuff yeah I think their writing is doing that too. You know, I, I remember 
an adventure we played as as kids that Charlie and I played together in a hobby shop somewhere. Um, and this guy, you know, he just had a he had a big rollout map on the table, and the entire game was just moving your figures through and him, you know, drawing it. And it was fun. But um, I think they're making a conscious effort with things like Waterdeep and Avernus to make it much more open and sandboxy. So you're, you're kind of finding your own way around. And every time you play it, it's a little bit different than the way the last person played it and maybe goes in a different order and all that. Yeah. Now, let's, um, let, let's just run through, you know, you are a very young company. Um, so we can run through pretty much everything that you guys have done. You, you're right now. You are within a couple of weeks of shipping Salt Marsh, Ghost of Salt Marsh. So, yep. And if That'll people, be silver edition. and if people go to your website, which gang is down in the description um, below the the video, um, people can get um, both Salt Marsh, and then there's a new one which is Avernus, and you are sold out of the water deep. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Right. So everything we do is a limited edition. Um, uh, so there were a thousand um, boxes of Waterdeep, and that sold out right about when we shipped. Um, we're way ahead of schedule for Avernus. Um, thank you, everybody who has taken a chance on us so far. Um, and we're getting close on Salt Marsh. We actually did. 1200 i think of salt marsh for the silver edition um and we're getting close to selling that out uh hopefully when we ship in early mid june we'll hopefully we'll hit that hit that number um and then you, the other thing that you're working on and it's the other link that i've got in there is um it, it's not a box but you did some um stuff with alex Kammer and frog god games on sea king's malice as well what was it that you did there yeah, we're really excited about that. I mean, it's it's um, it's a chance for us to branch out a little bit because, as you say, it's not a box and it's not wizards. It's uh, uh, we 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 um, what we've done is we put a map vault together. So we've taken some of the, the the most fun stuff from that adventure, which are the ships, and we've created uh, reusable maps and battle maps for the ships and our shipping and make those part of the Kickstarter. Which is awesome because everybody needs ships. It's whenever you've got a ship, you can never freaking lay your hands on a map <laughs> of a ship or any, you know, it's, it, you've got them. They're on the computer somewhere. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun because they're, uh, we basically did each one two sided. So the one side is as it is in the module. So without spoilers, some of them are in better condition than others by the time you find them. And then on the other side, we left them pretty much blank. We took all the interior bulkheads out and all the, um, you know, the basically made them perfect for a DM to to draw and use on as they like on dry erase. So that if I want to reuse it later on, exactly. I can just draw in my my new ship. That's that's right. a nice, nice job. Or if you like to if you like to run it as a dungeon crawl and you don't want the players to be able to see, you know, where the walls are in the next room, you can just have them go through it and and dry erase the walls in as you go. However you want to run it. They're called bulkheads. Sorry, bulkheads. This is <laughs> <laughs> This is my this is my navy veteran brother, by the way, which is okay. why he's such a stickler for detail. <laughs> they, we didn't have very many sales on our ships. <laughs> <laughs> he loses his card if uh, yeah. if he calls them walls. There you go. Um, so another question going back, what I'm doing here is I'm tracing back to a few of the notes that I wrote when you guys were talking earlier. Yeah. Um, so uh, you've mentioned that you've got a lot of partners that you work with. You've got some in Canada, some in Detroit. Um, what is it? So how... Let's say that, you know, D&D, uh, sorry, not D&D, Wizards of the Coast, um, they have a new module and they um, have presumably written some part of it, um, done some of their art direction, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on it, and then they give it to you guys uh, at some point in some level of completion and they say, go. How is it that you decide what it is that you're going to put into the box? 
It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a fun process. Uh, it's difficult. Oh, I mean, that, that um, bad, huh? <laughs> no, it, it's funny because, because we're right, we're right in the thick of it right now. Like we are all in the boxing ring, the five of us all kind of, you know, we've all brought in our own ideas because when you read it, we've all DM'd at some point or another. So we all have strong reactions to it. And now that we've, done one box and we have sort of our base set of ideas of things that we know we have to do. Now we're fighting about the sort of the edges of it, of, you know, which new things can we bring in that we've never tried before. And everybody's got their own things that they're in love with. And um, so it's, it's not, it's for us, it's never going to be a matter of we don't have enough ideas. It's a matter of we have twice as many ideas as we can possibly than we can possibly jam into that box, and now we've got to figure out which ones make the most sense, um, and whose babies are going to have to, you know, be pushed aside. So it's a really fun process. It's a it's a good thing that we're all really close old friends because <laughs> some of us are going to be disappointed. Yeah, um, and. Uh, uh, but it's it's a it's a great creative process, and uh, you know a lot of the times the ideas improve tremendously as we are in the middle of fighting things out. And you had one version of it in your head that you thought you were ready to die for, and then you fight about it for a half an hour, and somebody throws out a slightly different variation, and you go, "Oh, oh my God, that's so much better than what I had in mind to begin with." Yeah. Now um, I we. We, we, I know that you guys are actually together for a game, and I told you we'd only be around for an hour, but I want to ask another question uh, before we go, which is that all of the things that you showed me that went in the box uh, were paper, and so, you know, relatively flat. But, like, I know that in the Waterdeep box, you had um, physical things, like there were uh, pins, right, for various organizations. In yeah, Waterdeep. Sure. What are What are some of the... the, the the more substantial things that fill up that box. Yeah. So, um, as you say, we had a, a whole set of, of jewelry. There's another, um, thank God we, we met these people. Um, there's another wizards of the coast licensee, um, uh, called hand Cholo that has been doing D and D jewelry and they do amazing, amazing work. They're really cool and creative and collaborative. Um, so we've been doing a ton of stuff with them to give people these really cool little pieces of. Uh, I think it's uh, the one thing I don't. Have. Oh, we don't have any right now. All right, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah, that was uh, the one thing that, that I happened to, to pick up from the website. I knew there were physical things in there. Okay, yeah. Well, you take a look at it. But um, uh, yeah, so so we we love the idea of having wearables for players, things that they can you know if they join. The, the watch of Waterdeep, we get you get an actual badge of the watch. Yep. Um, so uh, we this is this is one thing we did for Waterdeep. This is so uh, I guess uh, you can't really do spoilers for Waterdeep anymore since it's been out for a while. Yeah. Well, one of the things, the big events that happens in Waterdeep is the players get an opportunity to take over a tavern if they do a, certain things correctly. So we really loved that idea. The idea of the party owning a tavern together just sounded super fun. So we created these little cups. You can just see it right there. It looks like this. It's a little travel cup. And you take the top off and it expands out into a little shot glass. So no, we included- Hold on, keep, in keep, keep, keep it up there, keep it up there. Okay, there, there it is. Cause I started, yeah. I started laughing as soon as you held it up. And of course, that, since I made noise, you know, Google Hangouts uh, switched it over to me. So, um, all right. So there's there's some examples. You know, we've we've seen of the of the of the physical stuff, um, the the various pins. Um, you can see uh, at least the Waterdeep stuff on their website. Although it's uh, you can't have it anymore. So that's just you pressing your nose against the glass of your computer screen. With that one, but um, well, we do sell the jewelry stuff. Yeah, oh, you we still, do you sell the jewelry separately. So you. If you need a Harper's pen, you can still go to our website and get a Harper's pen. Okay, awesome. So, so it's not entirely just pressing your nose against the glass like. No, a, there is a little bit you can still do. Okay, very good. Um, yeah. And and so uh, the the two places again, 
um, where you see the stuff is there, uh, you know, the Beetle and Grimm's website, uh, the Pandemonium Warehouse, I think you call it, um, and uh, and then Sea King's Malice for the uh, the battle mats of the of the ships are what you can get now. So, yeah, yeah. Check out Alex's the the Frog God Kickstarter for sure. It's a really fun adventure. Yeah, it's right. doing well too. This is really exciting. Yeah, it is. It is doing very well. Um, all right, guys. So, is there anything that I forgot to mention that you think is crucial, especially given that most of the audience here um, are is probably a sort of a division between Frog God Games fans um, uh, and and then also Maker DMs? Um, anything that you want to say to either one of those two groups before we sign off? You know, the uh, the only thing I would say is that it's some of the the best ideas that um, that we've worked with have been sparked by suggestions that have come back to us. So send us an email, con contact us on Twitter. We love to hear back from people about things that, that you've always wanted to see for an adventure or maps that you always wanted to see. You know, this map vault that we did for um, Sea King, if people like it, we'd love to start doing these regularly. This is a set of ships, but we'd love to do a set of caverns or a set of castles or you know whatever we'd love to start doing those things if people enjoy them and so let us know if that's something that sounds cool to you let us know about it and if you have an idea of what would be a cool next map vault for us to do uh hit us up that'd be great generic yeah. tavern do a generic tavern that has squares that cover more than five feet because when people pile in for a great big tavern fight you can't fit enough people into your regular tavern that's you need your generic Tavern fight battle map. Oh, that is an awesome idea. That's okay, idea. okay. So I'm going to press you on this. So, so if we want to do three maps, right? So we'll do a tavern. We, that would be we'd want to do in a theme. So maybe two other buildings that you'd have in a typical city. Like what else would you do? You're going to do um, a tavern. Uh, sorry, that's my dog barking in the background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you need a tavern. You need a place that you can rob. So, yeah. oh, okay. uh, like a store, a couple of right. storefronts, right. different you, kind of stores. Yeah. You, you got to think about what is it that people do in cities, right? They go and they buy stuff, and that's they're not going to get into a fight there, so you don't need a battle map there. Right. But you could do uh, you, but you do have a place where you get in fights, and that's a tavern. You yep. get uh, prisons where you have to rescue people because yeah. everyone burns. Everyone burns Absolutely. down. The, burns down the tavern during the bar fight. Right, right, uh, right. You need a place to rob stuff from, and the other thing right. that you need is probably a generic street. But you can't make streets too generic, or else they're just not going to work. But yeah. um, you know, those are. But you know, how are the buildings oh, arranged? Right. Uh, you know, sort of things like that. And if you can, if you can make an angle to where people can even see, because one of the things that everyone asks is how many stories is this building? Where are the windows located? Um, you know, so, so stuff like that, I would say uh, you might want to think about putting in, but definitely the, the big problem is you can't stuff enough people into a tavern, you know, using, mm -hmm. using half inch squares. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love it. Thanks. I love it. That's a great idea. Yeah. Good one. All right. So anyway, so we'll go ahead and we'll break it off here because I know that you guys do need to uh, to start getting into your game. Um, so there, there are last things. If anybody has suggestions uh, for things that you want to put in, put them down in the in the comments, and I'll forward them over to these guys at some point. Collect them up, um, and that way you know, you know, I'm, I'm not going to expect them to come and, and check the YouTube page every day or so, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll put that together. So, um, all right. Say goodbye to, to all of your fans that are watching, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate yeah, thanks, it. Matt. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and so, uh, just to to end up, whatever kind of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.